A few weeks ago, I wrapped on my very first feature length documentary where I was both the DP and the director, which is exciting and also a little terrifying. And right now I'm getting ready to edit down nearly 400 hours of footage into something hopefully coherent. Right now I can't show you any footage from that project yet, but as we were getting ready to film the last and probably the most important scene, I asked my production partners if they had any visual references I should take a look at ahead of time. One of them strongly suggested I watch the movie American Honey, and initially I was a little suspicious of watching a Shia LaBeouf movie for documentary inspiration, but let me tell you, I'm very glad I did. First off, it's nothing like Transformers. <laughs> uh, respectfully. And it's shot in a really great documentary style that got me excited to shoot my own scenes. Now, this isn't a movie review, but when I watch something that's really well done, it's inspiring. After the movie was over, I started thinking about what makes some documentary style cinematography work well and why some movies do it better than others. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today six documentary cinematography principles and how you can use them to push your shots to the next level. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back. And if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth and on this channel, I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, make sure to hit the subscribe button because I've got new videos coming out every week. So as you can tell, I am still on call on this shoot way up north in the Northwest Territories of Canada, but I think we're wrapping up here. So this is probably the last week you're gonna have to listen to this crappy audio in this hotel room. But for now I'm working with what I got, so I hope you don't mind too much. These days I'm noticing more and more narrative movies use documentary style shooting and in my opinion it can really help to make a story feel intimate and realistic. Beyond American Honey, other movies like Nomadland were also shot in a doc style using a tiny crew and it won the Oscar for Best Picture and was nominated for Best Cinematography as well. So I think I can safely say that the doc style, when done well, can absolutely hold its own even in the world of Hollywood. Obviously the key phrase here is when done well. But what exactly does that mean? And how do we break that down into actionable ideas we can put into practice on our own projects? Well, I've tried to break it down into six ideas. And if you can nail all of them at the same time, I think you'll be on your way to an insanely cinematic documentary. When I look at it, how American Honey was shot, the first thing that jumps out at me is that even though the filming style comes off like chaotic verite, the locations and lighting are all very intentional. Even though the movie is mainly set in a bunch of scummy motel rooms in the American South, the locations themselves really add to the style and feel of the story, and I'm positive that that wasn't an accident. On top of that, a bunch of scenes take place in really amazing light, either in golden hour or the blue hour just before dark, and the beautiful light combined with the gritty locations creates such a powerful mood that I think makes this movie interesting to watch. And that's the first tip on this list, control the location and time of day as much as possible. Even though documentaries are about real people and we can't just put actors in any location we want, there is still a lot of opportunity to pick good locations and times to shoot in. Now, there will always be situations where the events dictate things for you and there's no way you can tell your main characters to change the time of something really important like a wedding or a funeral or whatever. But in other cases, we as filmmakers can be more in control. So if you're filming the kind of story or scene where it is realistic for you to decide the time and place, do a location scout and find the best possible spot ahead of time and schedule the shoot in nice light rather than in the middle of the day. It's simple and maybe even obvious, but it can make a huge difference and it's something filmmakers of any skill level can wrap their head around. Once you're on location and hopefully at the right time of day, the second tip I'll give you is to get the most out of that glorious light by putting your subjects in the right places relative to your light source. And that's basically a really complicated way of saying that you should backlight whenever possible. This is a super popular cinematography tip these days, so I won't spend too much time on it here, but it's talked about so much for a reason. Backlight, or putting the subject of your shot between the main light source and the camera, creates rim lighting around your subjects that they pop out of the frame. If the sun is your main light source, for example, shoot your characters so that the sun is behind them, not the camera. So much of photography is about making a 2D image look 3D, and backlight is probably the easiest and most effective way to do this. Compared to frontal lighting, which looks flat and often washed out, Backlit shots have more depth and contrast and just look better most of the time, I think. I'm not gonna make this a video tutorial on how to use backlight, but if you wanna see more on this, let me know in the comments and maybe I can make something about it in a future video. But whenever you're not sure about the right angle to shoot from, try moving around to backlight your subjects. When I'm operating the camera, if a shot is looking flat to me through the viewfinder, the first thing I'll generally do is check to see if there's a way to backlight it. 
and more often than not, it ends up being the nicest looking frame. The next thing that jumped out at me when I was watching American Honey wasn't about the physical location or time of day, but instead about how the cinematographer Robbie Ryan composed his shots to make them feel like we're right there with these kids as they travel across the country by using layering and foreground elements to create depth in the images. This is called shooting dirty or a dirty shot, and basically means that there are foreground elements between the camera and the main subject in focus. The opposite kind of shot where there are no foreground elements is called a clean shot. There's a time and place for both kinds of these shots, but when I'm shooting, I personally try to shoot dirty as much as possible. I find that putting elements in the foreground pulls the audience's eye through the frame and makes for a more immersive picture. You can do this by peeking around a corner and leaving the wall in frame uh, out of focus, or by shooting through something like a car window, but leaving the rearview mirror or a dashboard in the frame, or maybe even use the back of a person's head and shoulders as you look past them to see someone else. American Honey does this so well, shooting around heads and through crowds, and it adds depth and layers to almost every shot, and I personally think it makes the movie much more interesting to watch. So when you're framing up your next shoot, look around to see if there's anything you can stick in the foreground and dirty up those shots a bit. Shooting dirty is a great technique, but for it to work properly, you're probably gonna wanna have full control over where the camera is focused. Autofocus can be great for interviews or maybe gimbal work, but when you're purposely trying to keep something out of focus in the foreground, I wouldn't want the camera accidentally deciding to rack focus in the middle of the shot because it got confused. And that's the third tip today, which is shoot with manual focus so that you, and not the camera is deciding what's important. I found dirty shots really hard to do using autofocus, and it's usually the law of the filmmaking universe that the camera will get things wrong at the worst possible moment. <laughs> Manual focus also allows you to do interesting panning shots like moving from a character's face down to their hands and then back again without the autofocus hunting around and ruining the shot. Manual focusing takes a bit of practice and one tip to make it a little easier is to use lenses with actual manual focus rings instead of fly-by-wire systems. A lot of stills lenses have really small focus throws and it can be a big challenge to dial in really precise focus when tiny turns of a millimeter or less can totally change the focal point. Cinema lenses have longer focus throws so that you can be really sure you're focusing on what you want without blowing past it by accident. Cinema lenses can be super expensive though and out of reach for a lot of people, but I found Sigma art lenses to be a pretty happy medium. They have a decent focus throw that's much better than the equivalents from the major manufacturers like Canon or Sony, and they're often quite a bit cheaper too. Old school photography lenses like the ones made by Nikon or old Leicas usually have great focus rings and if you hunt around in used camera stores, you can find some insane deals. Whatever you go with, picking a lens that helps you nail manual focus is super helpful. I found that Sony G Master lenses in particular are really hard to use manual focusing. On this shoot I'm on right now, we have a 70 to 200 G Master and it makes a crazy good picture, but just tiny little turns in the wrong direction and you completely lose the focal plane. So just because a lens is expensive, doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be the best for documentary work. It might be amazing for stills photography where you're using autofocus all the time, but don't necessarily think that just because you're getting a G Master lens or whatever the equivalent is from Canon, that it's gonna help you as a documentary cinematographer. Sometimes older can actually be better for things like this, so don't skip over old lenses just because they're not the newest thing out there. Okay, so you're shooting manual and racking focus to get some really cool dirty shots, and things are looking great in golden hour light. But if you really wanna make audiences feel like they actually understand the world of your characters and also give yourself better options in post, you need to be on the lookout for another kind of shot, the detail shot. Detail shots can be anything that adds to your story. In American Honey, we're constantly being shown details like the main character's chip nail polish early on, and that tells us so much about her and where she comes from. Right away, we know she probably lives a little bit rough and that she probably doesn't have an office job or something stable like that. It hints at the world being a little bit wild and maybe not having that much money, and we get all of that from a two second shot when it would have taken tons of dialogue to tell us the same thing. In my own career, I remember I was shooting an interview with a bunch of female assassins in Mexico a few years ago, and they were all kitted up with the skull masks and holding assault rifles like something out of Sicario. These people were for sure not angels, but every time we turned off the camera, their little kids would run into the room and the masks would come off and you could see that despite the lives that they were leading, these were still real people with families who loved them. During a break, I noticed that on a shelf just out of frame, there was a Mother's Day card in little kid's handwriting that said, I love you mama in Spanish. 
And that's something that most of us are familiar with in our own lives. It was really humanizing. And even though we might have been able to get this information out in an interview, by grabbing a detailed shot of it, we could cut away quickly in post and get the message across in about three seconds. The last tip I wanna to mention today is also about shot selection and how to get as much emotion out of your characters as possible. When shooting docs, the most powerful scenes often happen through moments of emotional change as experienced by our characters, like someone starting to cry unexpectedly. In moments like this, it can be hard to know exactly where to focus your attention, and it's really easy to panic and start shooting wildly. But if you can remember that it's the face and eyes that are the windows to emotion, you'll have a good starting place. So the sixth and final tip is to stay tight on faces during emotional moments. I'm not saying get the macro lens out and get all into their wrinkles or anything like that, but if you notice someone getting emotional or think they might be about to get emotional, get tight on the face and stay there for a while. How tight you want to get depends on your lens and the location and your own artistic choices, but I'd say the head and shoulders is a good starting point. Go tighter than the standard interview shot for sure, and I often like to get right in close, maybe even cutting off the top of the head so you can see into the person's eyes. You'll develop your own eye and preferred ways to frame with time, but if you can remember to get close when things get emotional, you'll come out with way more powerful scenes in the end. All right, so that's it. Six tips and tricks you can think about that will absolutely level up your documentary cinematography. American Honey is doing all these things throughout, and personally, I think it's shot in a way that I would love to replicate in my own documentaries. It really does look more like a doc than a Hollywood movie, and if the Transformers guy wasn't in it, I might even forget I was watching actors. Do yourself a favor and watch this one, because it definitely gave me inspiration for my own doc cinematography, and I'm sure it'll do the same for you. Thanks for watching, and hope that one was helpful. If you did like it, hit the subscribe button, because I've got more like it coming out every week. And if you did find it helpful, maybe try watching this other video I made about what I consider to be the best documentary on Netflix, period. See ya.